Nicole's question. I know that clownfish and the anemones have a symbiotic relationship. Are there any other fish that have similar relationships on the reef? Well, here we go again, right? So, we are talking. The thing about coral reef systems in the Great Barrier Reef is the amount of life in one square metre pretty well rivals anything else on the planet. So, I mean, you know, this is like you know New York, Tokyo, um, or Mexico City on hyperdrive. All these things living together, buzzing around. You, you're going to have interactions between species. I mean, that's what makes it great. From a tourism point of view, this is what we're talking about all day long, whether it's relationships between, like, you know, fish and corals. Uh, of course, Nemo is the classic one. The other one they made a movie about, which is a nice one too, is the cleaner ass. So the cleaner ass, getting back into one of my popular families, the wrasses, small fish, three species on the Great Barrier Reef, generally less than 15 centimetres in size. These things, typical wrasse, the mouth, small mouth, little sharp teeth, and they're really designed to pull the parasites, whether it's inside the mouth of the fish, the gills, around the eyes, the fins, the tail, wherever. They're designed to pull the parasites off fish. And I think I read an estimate somewhere a couple of years back. We're talking like about 10,000 parasites a day these things can feed. So they're constantly working. Uh, they're in pairs. You know, they have fixed spots on the reef. Uh, there's one species that don't. They tend to run. But, yeah, cleaner ass are definitely one. Another symbolic relationship that we often talk about, and these are probably just more kind of opportunistic. They tend to just pop up. You just see them all of a sudden happening in front of you, is... One nice large predatory fish out there called a giant trevally. Now, a giant trevally will go around the reef and they'll feed on basically fish, but they'll probably eat a lot of things. I think uh, David Abra had them feeding on um, on, on uh, seabirds and things like that as well. So, giant trevally, quite often you'll see white tip reef sharks and giant trevally always swimming around in pairs together. And my guess is the the white tips there hang around and trying to scavenge some little bits off, you know, the voracious feeding styles of the giant trevally. Another nice one that's come out in the last uh, couple of decades or so is the beautiful one where you often see as divers or snorkelers on the reef, you might get an octopus or a moray eel coming along and all of a sudden you'll have about three or four uh, groper species, coral trout following these guys everywhere they go. Makes sense. You've got an octopus or a moray eel coming through, you know, a nice little hole. You're a little fish down there, and you see this thing coming at you, and you go, well, man, I'm out of here. Bang, gone. So these guys come by, you know, and they hang on the outside and go, Shh, yeah, I'll take that. Thank you. So symbolic relationships are everywhere you look at them. And then we just get crazy as biologists, how we try to define them in different groups, you know, and, you know, and this is something that they could live without or not live with. They're definitely there. All right, let's move on. Next question, Bianca. Hi, Bianca. She goes, hey, Eric, are the fish affected by rising sea temperatures or can they adapt? Jenny, I think the answer to this is both. As a... As a biologist, you're always just in awe, really. Basically, life kind of always finds a way. You know, it probably shouldn't happen, but it just does seem to find a way. Um, I think this question we kind of need to break down in two parts. If we focus just mainly on what coral reef fish, you know, those fish that are mainly associated with coral reef habitats, you know, things like that. So with rising sea temperatures, there is a problem that we might lose or coral reef habitats will severely de diminish. You know, there is mounting evidence for this. And we're seeing them more, whether they adapt as well. Not too sure, but this is the burning question at the moment. So based on that, say if coral reefs keep diminishing and disappearing, you've got a whole lot of coral reef fish that are totally associated with live coral. So we might see those guys disappear. So you might that's that's a that's a possible scenario. The real big difference though between fish and coral is fish can swim. So fish have that behaviour. Now if the water's getting too warm, they can actually move and go somewhere where it's cooler. And we've got quite a lot of evidence. I have this on one species I work on. Uh, this guy here forms nice aggregations. It doesn't seem to be bothered by temperature. Forms nice aggregations all year long. I mean, for its spawning period, September to November. But there's another two I look at, and they only aggregate in winters and springs. And when they aggregate, I mean, like large numbers of fish come to the same site, in the same, roughly the same time, you know, every year. 
And when I look at the these guys, I've found in my data there on years where we've had like warm winters, like some El Nino years, uh, we'll actually see the aggregations don't occur. Um, things like that. And then you have cool year and the aggregations are back. And one species I work on are the thro um, in, um, uh, emperors. Uh, and they've found from a lot of acoustic work that a lot of emperors in those warmer years, they actually just spend the time deeper. They don't come up into the shallows. So they can change their behaviour. So fish can do that. There is another element to this question too. Very good questions from the community. Um, and that one is the physiological aspect, how it actually affects their metabolism. Some fish perform a little bit, uh, uh, like cold trout or one you know, their metabolism, they don't mind the kind of warm years a little bit. Their metabolism is quite high, that will feed that, but they're more prone to disease as well. Uh, so that's a question. Another one is egg development. If you're talking about fish reproduction, we have this kind of defined window when the precise temperature, depending on species, when the eggs can actually develop into a viable egg. So too much warm water, you might impact reproductive efforts and impact reproductive efforts, where you will see less adults coming through the system, so less population. So very good question, one that we can talk, and there's quite a bit of literature on this. Um, you know, if you get on Google Scholar, you'll find a fair bit too. Now, we'll get into Jim's question. What is the biggest fish on the Great Barrier Reef? <laughs> Seems simple question. Complex in its answer as well. Uh, gets back to kind of possibly what we call that coral reef fish again. When we say big fish, we're talking fish over a metre. We want to say big. So straight off the bat, you're talking half a dozen different species of coral reef fish out there. You know, you've got like about two species of your uh, urasses, which includes a parrotfish. You know, you've got several gropers. Um, sorry, I've got to turn my phone around. Several gropers. So, and like the Queensland grope I mentioned before, three metres in length, four five hundred kilos in weight, massive animal. Okay. But this is all kind of focusing on bony fishes. We haven't included the sharks in this. You've got a lot of sharks, you know, the cartilaginous fishes, which get over a couple of metres in length, quite thing. But the biggest of all, beautiful photo this. This is taken by friends of mine, uh, Yogi and Stella. I think they won an award with this one. Uh, it's a small one, but these things grow up to 18 metres in length. All right, The largest, uh, like I say, probably the largest shark, largest fish, and feed on the tiniest animals, plankton. you got to love plankton, you know. It fuels a lot of these big top predators. And the giant black marm was another representative too. I mean, five metres in length, uh, you know, several, probably several metres in length, you know, and once again, four, five hundred kilos in weight. So there's a few contenders from that. It probably just depends on what you want your definition to be. But, and going back to that final question from Paul, I think I've answered that. I'm probably starting to get past my little time bracket here. But feel free to contact me through Citizens anytime you want. I hope you enjoyed my little questions and thank you.